of our people here at the Shepherd's House, you're at home. We bless you. We love you. And uh, it's going to be a good word for you. Amen. Last week, the message was, uh, all I can say is full of compassion. How much the Lord loves us. He doesn't condemn us. And, and um, the main person who condemns us is ourself. You know, we, we, sometimes we don't feel like we measure up right or, or we do something getting a spout with somebody or we just, you know, we're not perfect, but we're willing to be perfected. As the Holy Spirit's working on us, we become more like Jesus. And when you think about the image that we're being changed into, oh my gosh, even Paul said, I haven't reached that yet. And none of us will till we get into finally that day we're with the Lord forever. Then as he is, we will be totally like him then, but we can be like him now. And, um, so we're, we're in an awesome, awesome, awesome day. Again, I, I just want to encourage everybody that, that all this craziness that's going on out there, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And, and a lot of these, these um, young people out there protesting and stuff, they just need Jesus. Yeah. They're being motivated by Satan, and they don't know it. They're pawns in his hands. And all the hate and stuff that's in them is from the, from the Antichrist. But I believe the church is going to be raised up in great power to, to begin to bring these. As the Lord showed me about them, he said, they're, they're just sheep without a shepherd. And uh, so now we can, as the church gets stronger and stronger and stronger, we can, we can bring them out of this darkness into light. So in our prayers, remember that mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, there is the wickedness that's out there that will definitely be judged. But there's a lot of, of, of people trapped in that who need the opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because God desires that none should perish. And so we have to remember uh, not to be so angry at what's going on, but to, if you're going to take your anger, direct it towards Satan and, um, and then let the the love of Christ in you go out to those who are trapped in this thing. They don't know it, but we have the power to set them free. We have the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the anointing and authority of the Holy Spirit on our lives. We are the answer. The church is the answer to, to the uh, craziness in the world. So we are going to see the church rise up because Jesus, it's all about the Lord Jesus. It's not about you or me or it's about Satan fighting Jesus. That's the fight. But we win it in the spirit realm. Amen. And uh, so that's why uh, on Wednesday nights, um, it's a prayer night. We're going to turn into a prayer night between now and the election. We're going to win this thing in the spirit realm. And uh, also to let everybody know, especially those online, we will not be live streaming Wednesday nights. I just feel like the Lord, I heard this, of course, I've been in the Navy, and I heard all hands on deck. That means that's a battle station call. Take your place. We need all hands on deck. No matter what you're doing, drop it. Go to your battle station. We need every hand. So I really believe Wednesday night, that's why I didn't want to do a media. I didn't want anybody that comes to do anything but spiritual battle and intercede. And, and last Wednesday night, it was great. Uh, he had some words from the Lord. People prayed that this uh, came up forward and we have an open mic. So as we're praying in the spirit, if someone has a word or a prophecy or, or a, a, a prayer to pray in the understanding, they come up and take the mic and, and um, it was powerful and it's going to get more powerful. And um, remember this, we don't only win, we've already won. Right. And just read the end of Revelation, you'll find out we've already won. And I believe that's why when uh, we're to fight the good fight of faith, and I like what Marilyn Hickey said, it's a good fight because we've already won. But it is a fight. But it's our faith that conquers. It's our faith that overcomes. And uh, it's a time to be strong, faithful, not fearful. Um, because God is, is, getting, is, is already moving in powerful, powerful ways. We're seeing people saved and baptized, and, and um, we'll see some Saul of Tarsus come out of this. Some of those most adamant, radical people, I think, is going to be 
saved and get just like Saul of Tarsus became Paul. And now he became radically uh, on fire for Jesus. So some of these will, same thing's going to happen to him. We've got to always remember something. Our God's a good God. Our God loves us. But he's also a God of justice. And justice is coming to America. Justice will come. And um, truth will prevail. God hates evil. He loves righteousness. And so you can, you can be guaranteed that the spirit of the Lord will raise up fear of the Lord in the land, that glory can dwell in the land. We will see the whole earth covered with the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God. We'll see nations uh, do uh, what the word of God, what Jesus sent us to do to make disciples of all nations. We'll see nations tremble in the presence of God. And I've seen this so strongly that, that you know, this coronavirus how it has just affected and shut down the whole world. Well, the revival is going to do the same thing, only it's not going to shut down the world. It's going to open the world to Jesus Christ. And I believe the news media won't be able to hide it. They can't cover that because the multitudes that's coming to Christ, uh, the, the miracles and healings that will be taking place, not just in church buildings, but in the marketplace. I can see the, just as you know, you, when I see these protesters all over, I see the people being saved all over. Instead of the streets being filled with protesters, can you imagine the streets be filled with those who are worshiping and praising God? And that happened exactly in the Welsh revival. They said every morning the coal miners, as they walked, they walked abreast with each other, walking to work, singing hymns. And it said every pe people wake up every morning hearing these old tough coal miners worshiping God, walking to work. The streets were literally filled with people worshiping God. And we're going to see that again. We're going to see it with our own eyes. We're going to be a part of it. Uh, September 26th, uh, you know, there's a big uh, Franklin Graham, uh, Rabbi Kahn, uh, I think Lance Wall now, and other ministries, they're calling for a, a uh, prayer uh, march and, and gathering in Washington, D.C., so even though the enemy's setting up their camp, we're going to set up our camp. And I can just believe at least a million or more people be there on September 26th in the capital. We're going to pray this thing through. Also here on September 26th at, at, at uh, Parker Square, there's going to be a gathering for prayer and worship. And I've been invited to give the altar call. So it's going to be awesome. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> We just got to trust our God, and, and this is a day um, for the church to become active with the power of the Holy Spirit. If you've watched what's happened, uh, a lot of our uh, church is not the true church. There was a pastor last week that stood up and said that abortion and Christianity is compatible. You don't understand this, but George Soros, not only is he paying people to do, he's paying some pastors and churches to be uh, aligned with his agenda. You got to understand what's going on. But what, what you see is the scripture says that that which is false must be shown so that which is true can come. And so what we're seeing right now is, is the compromised church, the church that's not saved, but we're getting ready to see the real church. The body of Christ rise up with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a day that the Lord has made and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for the church to awake and uh, wake unto righteousness and walk in the ways of the Lord. And so God's going to deal with our complacency, going to deal with our indifference and, uh, I'm just, I'm just thank God the God of this, uh, the, the athletic God of the United States has been shut down. I don't apologize for that one bit. The church is the answer to the world because we are the body of Christ. Scripture calls us this, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I think we're seeing a great thing happen worldwide to the church. And um, 
Today, I just want to talk about that we must have a passion for Jesus. The whole heart of Christianity, it's not a doctrine. It's not a scripture. It's not tradition or doctrines of men. The whole heart of a church is a passionate love for Jesus Christ. To experience his passionate love for us. Because it's a love and passion that compels us to bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when everything, anything else captures our passion, it's an insult to God. It's an abomination. If we have passion for something else that's greater than our passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, that's an idol. It's wrong. Because what you have a passion for, you will pursue. And so if you have anything, if any of us have anything in our life that there's a passion in us or in me that's greater than the passion for Jesus that draws my attention more to that passion than the passion for Jesus, that's wrong. That's sin. And it'll keep you carnal. It'll keep you minded on things of the earth. If there's anything on earth that has more passion in your heart that takes more of your time, more of your energy than the gospel of Jesus Christ, then I'm telling you right now, you're carnal. Because you're allowing your carnal senses to pull you in a passion towards something greater than Jesus. It can be a mate. It can be, uh, it can be uh, sports. It can be uh, anything. You, you, you name it. Anything in the world. It could be food. If there's anything in the world that draws your passion more than your passion for Jesus, you're not going to hear what the Spirit is saying to you in these last days. We've got to come so close to Jesus and have such a passion for him that his passionate, compelling love consumes us. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Word of God, filled with the love of the Father, and then empowered to change society empowered to change what's going on. Man, I, I just, I mean, the Lord's just consuming me with this, that we must have a, 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 be overwhelmed with this passionate love for us. Because it's, again, I just got to reiterate this. You're, you will pursue your passion. Where your heart is, your treasure is. Where is your heart planted right now? Is it, is it planted in the passion for Christ, a passion for his word, a passion for his spirit, a passion for the Father's love, a passion for the kingdom of God. The number one, you know what the number one, uh, if you use the word work in a good sense, you know what the number one work of the church is? Is to seek the kingdom of God. We know the scripture, seek first his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. And everything you have need of will be added to you. Everything. So we don't have to worry. We don't have to be a people that, is God going to help us? Is God going to bless us? Is God going to feed us? The things that the Gentiles, see, the world seeks after. What am I going to wear? What kind of car am I going to drive? What kind of home? What kind of food? And I said, your, your heavenly father, he knows you have all needs these, these things. It's his good pleasure to give us his kingdom. And, and the king, if you, if you true uh, kingdoms, the king is responsible to take care of the people in the kingdom. That's what a king is supposed to do. Now, there are evil, worldly, wicked kings who put their people into bondage, slavery, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus is the perfect king of kings. So it's up to our king to take care of us. Our father, it's up to our father to take care of us. We're just little children. And without Christ, we can't take care of ourselves except the world's way. But with Christ, then everything we have need of is provided. That's an awesome, awesome truth. So we don't have to worry. We just stay in love with Jesus. We just allow his passion to consume us. That's awesome. I want to read it out of the Passion Translation. And it's in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 
starting at verse 14. This is so powerful. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. What a powerful statement. It is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. See, the love of the world can fuel your passion. And if that happens, then you're going to be in love with the world. But when the love of Christ, the love of the Lord Jesus fuels our passion, then we're full of the love of Christ. And it motivates us. I want to read a, a little footnote on this. Paul uses the Greek word syneko. Sin means to come together. Echo is where we get our word echo. And being translated, this is what it means. To seize, compel, urge, control, lay hold of, overwhelm, completely dominate. I don't know about you, but I want to be seized. I want to be compelled. I want to be urged. I want to be controlled. I want to lay hold of the love of Christ. I want to be overwhelmed by it. I want to be completely dominated by the love of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to be overwhelmed with the, the Lamb of God. I want to be overwhelmed with the, the blood of Jesus, the love that's in that blood. That blood that paid the price for me. That blood that, that paid the horrible price that I might have eternal life. I want to be overwhelmed with that blood, the love that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Not a doctrine, not a theology, not, a, not a just a, uh, uh, talking about the blood, but being overwhelmed with the love that's in that blood. I want to be overwhelmed with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be overwhelmed with his passionate love for me because then I will have a passionate love for him. Here in his love, not that we first loved him. He loved us. It says the father, because of his passionate, intense love for us before the foundation of the world, he even then, while we were yet sinners, in his heart and mind, Christ already died for us and seated us in heavenly places with his son. That was before the foundation of the world. That's his purpose and intent. And for all who call upon the name of the Lord, we enter into a place that's already been established for us in the heart of God. But we have to understand it's in that position of intimate, radical, passionate love that, that the Holy Spirit consumes us and can reveal Christ to the world through us. It motivates us to do not our will, but his will. It says this, I like what this says. Paul is stating that the motivated passion of his life is Christ's love filling his heart, leaving him no choice but to surrender everything to God. The love of God, when the love of God constrains us, controls us, dominates us, fills us, you know what? We just want to serve him. We don't want to, we don't want to do anything uh, one, one of the uh, old timer, uh, Jonathan Edwards, said this. He said, I would rather offend everybody in the world than defend my God. Yes. Because that's what the love of Christ cons compels us to do. To love God, to love people. To walk in the passionate, compassionate, powerful love of Jesus Christ towards humanity. Man, that's awesome. And the church <clears throat> right now is being brought back by the passionate love of Christ for us, brought back to the place of manifesting that passionate love to others, bringing healing to everyone. It's God's good pleasure to heal everybody. That's what God wants to do. That's what God is, is, is willing to do. And by the grace of God, that's what he's going to do in this house and throughout the whole body of Christ. God never desired for anybody to be sick. He never desired for anybody to die. Death was never in his radar. But we do know that through sin, death came. The sin of Adam committing treason and turning, turning the control of the world over to Satan. But thanks be to God. God 
is the God of this earth. Heaven and earth belongs to God. And we, the church, have been given spiritual dominion over darkness so that we can go in prayer and God will declare our, our prayers, our prayers of declaration, declaring what God is doing, speaking what God is doing, releasing the covenant promises of God so that his power and his glory can go forth and bring healing to everybody that can bring people out of darkness into light. Paul was, he said that this love, this passionate love of Jesus controlled him, compelled him. His whole reason for preaching the gospel was not a sense of duty. It wasn't a, a uh, you'll, be, you'll be damned if you don't. It was the compassionate love of Jesus Christ that compelled Paul to be beaten five times, imprisoned, uh, beaten with rods, shipwrecked, stoned. Only the love of Christ compelled him. And he wrote about 57% of the New Testament. But when did he write that? He wrote it in prison. He wrote it when he was put in a position where he could write. And God didn't put him up in a hotel Hilton with food service. He was in prison. And not the kind of prison we think about. There's no large TV there. There wasn't a workout room. We've seen those prison jails he were in. There's just a carved out piece of rock with bars in front of it. See, when the love of Christ compels us, consumes us, when his passionate love for us absolutely consumes our life, then all this exterior stuff doesn't matter. It can't control us. It can't cause us to have a passion for anything else but him. Man, this is so awesome. And then it goes on to say this. Verse 14 again, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means that all died with him, those who accepted Christ, you're dead in Christ, the old man's dead. So that those who live, I want you to hear these words, no longer live self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him, the one who died for us and now lives again. It's time for the church to quit living a self-absorbed life. Amen. And just throwing in, well, we go to church on Sunday morning. I'm a faithful church goer. Well, you might be a faithful church goer, but it's not about the church. It's about the kingdom of God. Are you a faithful servant, son, daughter in the kingdom of God? Because you don't serve a church, you serve Christ. And it's his passionate, compelling love that purchased us with his compelling blood of love so that we can receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Father, be filled with his passion, be filled with the gifts of the Spirit, be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, be filled with the Word of God. We couldn't even understand the Word except we have the Spirit to reveal it to us. But what is it that compels, we have to look at ourselves, what compels my life? What is the most compelling part of my life? If it's not Christ, I'm telling you right now, he is in second place in your life. Maybe third place, maybe fourth place. Well, I'll get around to Jesus a little later. Well, I'll go to church on Sunday and satisfy my duty. But what about the kingdom of God that you must walk in every day? Is the kingdom put on a Sunday morning shelf? Now, if you're real faithful, then on a Sunday morning, Wednesday night shelf, is that, where, is that where the kingdom's placed? Is that where Christ is placed in your life? That you come on Sunday morning and take him off the shelf? And then feel good about yourself? Or is it, David said, every morning I rise up and I seek him and I praise him. And then I was reading it this morning, the living translation, uh, the passion translation in Psalms 5 says this. I get up in the morning and I take the pieces of my life and lay it at the altar and the fire of God's love lights up my life. 
Man, I, that just set me on fire. I lay my life, David said, every day before the Lord and the fire of his love lights up my life. Where, where do we lay our life in the morning? What lights you up during the day? And if it's not Christ, you're going to be lit up with the world. You're going to be lit up with, with something of the world. Maybe it's the news. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's a, uh, little games you play. I don't care. I don't know what it is. But when you get up in the morning, what lights up your life? Is it the fire of God's love? Is it the kingdom of God that you understand you are in the kingdom now? You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Does the passion of Jesus Christ light up your life? Because that's what's going to bring revival. I'll read you an excerpt. This is from S.B. Shaw, one of my heroes. During the Welsh revival, he said there was an intense passion for Jesus. There was an intense passion for worship and prayer. There was a unity created by the Holy Spirit. The presence of God was everywhere. Well, the presence of God needs to start in you, in your life, in your home. And it comes by a passion for Jesus. And being lit up with this passionate love in your life. I know through this pandemic, a couple things are happening. The real, cold, unbelieving church is being exposed. But the church that's on fire with the passionate love of Jesus is also being exposed. We're seeing people saved. We're seeing California thousands going out on the beaches worshiping God against an order that the church can't sing. There's a time to obey the government. There's a time when you can't obey the government when it violates the gospel. We see in Portland, we see people being baptized. You don't see that in news media. But right now, there's the churches up there getting people saved. God always sends a people who's passionate for Jesus, who's not afraid of the world, that's not compromised with the world, but will go with a passion of Jesus for the world and lay their life down so that others can come into the light that they live in. This is awesome. Because what you do in the morning establishes your day. I heard Jesse DePlantis say one time, he said, I get up every morning, I worship God, I declare my faith, and then I just walk in that faith all day long. I walk in the grace. You walk in what you establish when you get up in the morning. I'm just telling you, it's the way it is. Where's your passion? What are you passionate about? What is consuming you right now while you're home? What's consuming you? I want to be consumed with the passionate love of Jesus Christ. Because then, Paul says, that love is what compels me to preach the gospel. That love is what keeps me going after I've been beaten five times. It's that love that keeps me going. It's the compassion of Jesus in me and my passion towards him that, that compels my life to be controlled by the Holy Ghost and the love of the Father. Passion locates us. Passion locates you. Because, again, I've got to keep saying this to you. What you're passionate for is what you're pursuing. We've got to be passionate for Jesus. You know why? Because we respond to his passionate love for us. A passion that compelled him to lay his life down for us. A, a, a passion that compelled him to obey the Father. A passion to, to go on that cross and be shamefully humiliated, hung up naked before the world. And then to move into that which he hated, sin itself, he became. It was his passionate love that shed that blood. And that blood speaks louder than the blood of Abel. That blood speaks of the love of Jesus Christ. And that blood has purchased us. 
so that we no longer belong to ourself, but we belong to the one who passionately, compassionately loved us so much that he gave his life so that we now can live in the quality and the quantity of eternal life now. And yes, someday we'll be with the Lord forever. But even now, when you and I got born again, we entered in to eternal life, the quality of it, the quantity of it, the power of it, the zeal of it. And self goes to the cross in this process so that the compassion of Jesus consumes us for others. There are many times when, you know, I don't feel compassion. But when someone comes along that needs Christ, I get consumed with passion and compassion for that person. And I may not feel it. My brain might say, I don't want to even talk to that person. But there's a separation because I've been separated unto Christ. Now, when you step into that situation that you didn't want to be in to begin with, you may not even like that person, but when you step into that situation and all of a sudden compassion compels you because your nature is compassion. Your nature is passion like Jesus and joy unspeakable and full of glory. Church, are we just waiting for the pandemic to get over, to get on with our life again? Oh, that the, 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 everything will get better again. The rioting will stop. Sports will come back. Happiness will come back. If that's your passion, you are rejecting the passionate love of Jesus Christ for you. You can deal that deck any way you want. It's going to come out the same. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. Because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means all of us have died with him. We've all been crucified in Christ, now raised from the dead. So that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him, the one who died for us and now lives again. We have to ask ourselves a question. Am I living that kind of life? Am I living in that passion inspired by the Holy Ghost and me? Where have you put Jesus in your life? Is he on a shelf waiting for this pandemic to get over? And then he can come back out and I can live my life the way I was before. Do you have a compassion for these protesters and not a hate? You have to guard that. You have to fight that. But they are ones who have not experienced the passionate love of Jesus for them yet. But that's a side note. The main course is, where's the church? The ones who have received the passionate love of Christ. The ones who have received the great spirit of the Holy Ghost. The Father's love in us. Where are we? Where is the church? Are we too hiding in our caves? Waiting for this to pass? Entertaining ourselves? Twilling our thumbs? Directing our passion towards everything else but Jesus? Where are we? Let's locate ourselves. And the location of ourself is the passion of Jesus Christ. Do you passionately love him? Then are you passionately experiencing and expressing him? Where is our passion? We have to locate it, church. Jesus is our passion. Because we are the object of of his passion and love. He would that none should perish. 
because he wants to take his passionate love and direct it into other people's hearts that don't know him. It's time for us, the church, to be radically, passionately, overwhelmingly in love with Jesus. And that translates in how much am I passionately, overwhelmingly in love with you and the lost world to save them. Because you see, whatever you're passionate for, that passion will direct you. And you'll release that passion towards something else that you're doing. If you're passionate for food, you're going to direct your passion towards eating. If you're passionate for sports, you're going to direct your passion towards sports. If you're passionate for anything else, towards your wife, towards your husband, towards your work, towards anything else, that's where you direct your life towards. Because what you're passionate about, you will pursue. It's a time, church, to be completely passionate for Jesus. And in this passionate process, self goes to the cross. So you can be passionate about yourself. It's about me, Lord. I'm passionate for me. Then your life is about yourself. Wednesday night, Jennifer came up here and she broke. She began to cry for the loss. She didn't care about what did people think of her tears or her emotions. I watched her right up here. She broke. She began to compassionately, with tears, cry out to God for the lost. Do we even care? Is that a side note? Or is it a passion that there's a people that don't know Jesus Christ? And it's our passionate love for Jesus that will release a passionate love for them. I watched others come up and pray and their heart going out to others. Our passion going out for Oscar's kidneys to come. Our passionate going out for people who need healing. But it all comes when we're passionately beyond any type of emotion we could express in love with Jesus the lover of our soul. Now you can foo-foo what I'm saying. You can say, oh, pastor, that's a nice message. I love Jesus. No, you don't. I do too. No, you don't. You don't. You love him according to the way you want to love him. You love him according to the way he fits into your life. That's not love. That's convenience. That's self-preservation. Well, I'll, I'll get around to serving him one of these days. No, you won't. Not until you meet his passionate love for you. And revival will bring the passion of Jesus Christ to the nation, to the church. I just read to you what happened in Welsh Revival. A passionate love for Jesus was everywhere. And when that happens, you too then will come into that atmosphere of his presence and his glory and his love. Because that's what God's creating here. That's what God is after. That's what God wants in your life. He wants you to be passionately in love with him by his passionate love being compelled towards you. And then the world will know us. How? By our love, our compassionate love of the Holy Spirit for all humanity, especially for the household of God. (laughs) 
It takes a compassionate love of God to put up with each other. I mean, let's just get real. There are brothers and sisters in the body of Christ that, by golly, it can just rub us wrong. And you might be one of those. I might be one of those. Maybe it's me that's rubbing you wrong. But see, if I'm passionately and you're passionately in love with Jesus, love covers. It's the glory of the Lord to conceal a thing so that I can passionately put my love towards you. That's awesome. I'm not so sure Jesus liked everybody he died for. <laughs> he got upset with his disciples a few times. Oh, you have little faith. How long am I going to put up with you? But I'm compelled by love to go to the cross for you. We are compelled by love to go to the cross for other people, to lay our, down our feelings towards them and love them. And when we, when we make that desire to be passionate and in love with Jesus and experience his compassionate love for us, that's going to create the atmosphere of revival. That's going to bring multitudes to Christ, but it's going to change your life, church. It's going to change your life. So I just need to read this to you one more time and then I'm going to receive an offering. Do I do everything right? No. Call Dorothy, she'll tell you. Do I do everything right as a pastor? No. Only one man did everything right, and his name is Jesus. But I'm full of his love. And I have a passion for him that consumes me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. That's why 1,500 pastors a, a month are quitting in the United States of America. You know why? Because they don't, they don't know the compassionate love of Jesus. They've been wore out with ministry. But when you're passionately in love with Jesus, you're not going to be wore out with anything. Amen. <laughs> I want to read this to you one more time. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us. Because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means all died with him. We were all crucified with Christ. Now we're alive with him. So that those who live should no longer be self-absorbed lives. But lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us and now lives again. Is that awesome? Father, I just thank you. I've delivered my soul. I've challenged myself. I've rebuked myself. I sense the power of the Holy Spirit compelling us with the love of Jesus Christ to come and experience him and experience the Father and to be hungry for the word and to, Lord, be an expression of your love everywhere we go. That you're going to create the atmosphere by the love of Jesus Christ whereby revival will sweep the world. The great glory of God manifested. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That you have the measuring rod in your hands. You measure every heart by the love of Jesus Christ. Your word penetrates and divides the soul and the spirit. And you look upon the heart of a man or a woman. I pray this morning you've opened up hearts. I pray that you've broken hearts. That you break them for the love of Jesus Christ. That you consume them with his passionate love for them. That they then can respond and out of a passionate love for Jesus bring others. And live a life pleasing to you, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you come and bring healing to everybody that you begin to bring the atmosphere of heaven into this house whereby the kingdom of God is manifest in the name of Jesus, to the glory of our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift our hands a minute and let's just begin to say, Father, we love you. Boy, if God has touched your heart, you just say, Jesus, forgive me. 
that I have anything that I put more passion on than you. That my mind's been consumed with anything that's greater than you, Jesus. Cleanse us of this. Give us grace. Give us grace. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And our neighbors, ourself. Touch your people's heart with the passionate love of Jesus that would compel them to love, to good works. In Jesus' name, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit.